Friday afternoon, folks. Ted Ralston here in downtown Honolulu with Think Tech Studios. Uh, at 3 o'clock, actually, not 4 o'clock. So you may have to uh, adjust your brain if you think this is actually 4 o'clock. And you're looking for Kawi Lucas. She'll be on at 4. We're on at 3 today. We did a swap -a so that uh, she could attend a meeting downtown. That explains why we're on here at Think Tech Hawaii at uh, where the drone leaves at 3 instead of 4. Anyway, um, where the drone leads, the drone leads to absolutely cool and incredible new ways of expression. And that's one of the aspects of drones that we'll hear a lot about in the future. I'd like to welcome to our show today, Dr. Scott Ressland of Berkeley, right? <laughs> not, not someplace else, <laughs> right? Drone Sports Association, that's <laughs> drone right. Drone Sports Association and many other affiliations, I might add, uh, over the time of the past and probably a lot more in the future. And joining us also from California is Bruce Parks. And uh, Bruce is a business partner of Scott's. He's supposed to be working today. He should be tired and ready to uh, you know, knock it off and take it easy, but look at him. He's already I'm on a little hot time. He's, he's been, <laughs> ever since you left, he's been really taking it easy, looks to me. So. Yeah, but you know, you got to remember, it's 6 o'clock here. <laughs> well, it's Friday. It's Friday. That's core, core working time over here. I'm, I don't know what, what's wrong with you, Bruce? But anyway, Bruce, welcome aboard again. You've been on this show several times. And uh, Scott, first timer. Anyway, we're talking about uh, an absolutely incredible aspect of the drone world of today and incredibly uh, larger in the future, and that's the world of drone racing. And uh, when you think of drone racing, if you're in Hawaii here, we're not talking about drag racing out on Sandy Beach Road at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's drag racing. We're not talking about oval racing around the track and kind of knock each other off. We're talking about a whole new method of rapidly evolving capability against multiple challenges that are thrown at you in maybe an unstructured or unscheduled way, and you have the air components. We have three dimensions here, plus we have time, and we have the need to extract information from what's going on in the, on the, in the race course and make decisions really fast and not hit anything on the way. That's a really layman's expression of what drone racing is all about, but before I ask Scott to talk a little bit more about that, my own perception is that we have not only the racing function and the interest in that, we have a great draw that can bring in students and, and their parents and educators and such because of, the, uh, of the, the, the rapid time cycle and the need for technology and the need for creative and, and critical thought in, to make this work. So uh, without, um, uh, without me running the, the, the whole circuit here, running up all the time, let me just ask Dr. Scott, I'll call you Scott, and. Uh, Tell us a little, about, a little bit about how you came into the drone racing game and what's the future here on Oahu very shortly looking yes. at. Well, actually, the, the whole thing started in Hawaii, actually. I, I, was, uh, I was down here on uh, some Department of Education business. I was working with the uh, Department of Education and some of the immersion schools here. And I happened to bring my drone with me that uh, had a brand new, new technology to it called first-person view. And so you could fly around as if you were sitting in the, the cockpit of the, of the drone. And so I actually, this is before, here in Hawaii, here in Hawaii. Ago, yep. right? that's yeah. right, so I did it on the big island, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, because I had a bunch of kids with me, and I, they all stood around my monitor, and we all looked at it, and, they, and that fascinated them, and that kind of kick-started my, oh, this is kind of a very interesting thing for teaching STEM, because it's the first time that I've ever seen, like, higher-level critical thinking and problem-solving kind of suddenly be experiential and practice-based instead of standing a lecture and trying to tell a kid how to learn critical thinking, problem-solving skills that any doctor would need or surgeon or anything like that. So you can immediately, immediately, immediately apply the new insight you've got, turn it into a piece of hardware or a piece of software and test it out. Mm -hmm. And the motivation is is that now uh, you've got <laughs> racing and that means uh, that you're going to be up till 3 o'clock in the morning making sure your airframe is going to be able to let you kick your friend's butt. And if you think back to the history of the automotive business, it, I, I think in 1905 or something like that, cars were just new on the market. They were racing them already. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. the Indy 500, the first one was something like 1908 or so. So 1949 was when NASCAR started, and it literally was 49. when, okay. when uh, NASCAR came out of the bootlegging industry. So uh, on the weekends, the bootleggers never uh, raced. Uh, sorry, never, never ran bootleg. Never bootleg. That's right. So what ah. they did was is that on Sunday they all raced because then that's when all of the punters would take a look at who had the fastest car. <laughs> and on Mondays when they got hired. Okay. So this is how the whole thing started of win on Sunday and, and race on and get paid on Monday, right? And so that's how the whole thing kick-started. So in true form of that, uh, drone racing literally came out of 
kind of the, the rebels and the, the people that weren't uh, allowed on AMA fields, and so we kind of started... Non-conformist, you might say. The non-conformist. Yeah. We were also kind of all, you know, our day jobs were typically working for Google or uh -huh. Facebook. Professor or, of, at, at Berkeley or yeah, something like so that. We have yeah, so we have a higher, you know, interest in technology yeah. and soldering skills and that kind of stuff. And so naturally, when you got two drones together, well, you're going <laughs> to race them, right? right? <laughs> and so that's the rest is history. That's pretty good. And Bruce, how about you? How did you get into this game? Well, I had a bad day one day and met Scott. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it's had a day. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's a joke, of course. But no, I met Scott here in Sacramento, which is where I live, uh, uh, with the uh, very first drone, nat when the first drone nationals were run here in Sacramento in July of uh, mm -hmm. last year. You weren't running liquor or something in drones, were you, that led to that discovery or <laughs> something like that, Bruce? Well, I'm sorry, say that again, You Ted? weren't running liquor or illegal booze or something like that is, is how you got into this game then. Well, yeah, we were kind of dropping off bottles from the air. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's first version right. of Amazon <laughs> delivery, wasn't it? Okay. So. Uh, and so you met Scott? So, so I met Scott, and I've been working with Scott for the past year trying to uh, help to facilitate you know, getting the racing sport up and running. Yeah, when, you know what's interesting, and Bruce, you know, Bruce is being incredibly modest here, but um, Bruce has been instrumental in making sure that, that drone regulation also dovetails into all the FAA stuff, it, it dovetails into the safety aspects of things. And so drone racing, because it is the pinnacle of, it's the spear tip of drones and UAV stuff. So it's always been kind of the, the first instance where when we walk out onto the field, people go, wow, is that a drone? And then they look at it and they go, well, there's no missiles on it, and I'm pretty sure that thing's not going to be peeping in my window because you're too busy racing and it's really fast and loud and noisy and fun. And they, it's the first time that it switched the, the public's um, opinion about what drones are and what, they're, what they can be used for. So it's the first use case that's mm. been above and beyond anything that has a camera on it or, uh, you know, because most of the, the, the drones right now, we're still stuck in the media saying, oh, well, you're going to, you know, we have to build all this big privacy legislation around it, when in fact, it's not the case. It's, we're moving very quickly away from that. Um, and so drone racing is, is not only just um, a great sport and fun to do, but it's addressing this big problem that we're having with uh, understanding what drones can, can change and do for us in the next century. You know, that's, i got to talk about Bruce a little bit, with you listening, of course, Bruce, but taking to, to the point you just raised, I had a briefing about two or three years ago. I was invited to brief a bunch of NSF retirees, National Science Foundation retirees on drones. I thought, okay, this, I'm not sure who's going to brief who here. I went to the house where the people were assembled, and they had no idea. These are NSF scientists, retired, I might say, but they had no idea that we're talking this scale and innocent and... and uh, not armed and not part of uh, mm -hmm. you know 110,000 pound things that are flying over somewhere and dropping bombs. Mm -hmm. They, they had, no one ever showed them. Mm -hmm. and you, I would think that that community of all would get the picture, but no, it doesn't. So the point you are raising is that we ne really need to over communicate that picture over mm -hmm. and over again. And I'll say that talking about Bruce, we first met about a year ago when he came over for a uh, fourth of the workshop at on an I and then out in uh, Kualoa, and we had him up at the workshop at UH, and. Uh, uh, I was sitting next to Bruce, and he was explaining a bunch of things. I thought, okay, exactly what kind of an engineer are you? Because I hear engineering-related terms, but I don't hear, I don't hear, don't, don't hear him stuck in those terms. I hear him going way much broader than that. So I was always trying to figure out there exactly where did Bruce come from in this game? Because it was such a rich uh, conversation, and it wasn't one-dimensional, which is what I'm normally used to experiencing. And then Bruce told me what he really does. And I was uh, totally struck by that, but your point is, and how he operates is so important because we have to get that expression of the utility mm -hmm. and, and remove from it that, mm -hmm. that appearance and that aspect that the term drone, unfortunately, uh, Well, let, let, let me, up. let's just take an example of how fast this is really moving. So we did the, the first 2015 Drone National Championships in Sacramento. The day after that, I got a phone call from ESPN. ESPN said, we're interested in broadcasting this as a, as a sport. And so that took us about eight months because there were no rules and regulations. Um, Disney is part of, of ESPN. So we had to really um, rewrite the rules of how do you use drones in an entertaining format and in a broadcast format. And so over the, the, over the eight months that we finally did come to an arrangement, 
uh, drones racing has become uh, so substantial. There's a lot of money that's being put into it. And they wanted to do not only just uh, one or two races, but they wanted to do to a couple of races uh, over three years plus an international distribution thing. So it suddenly means that drone racing is now broadcast. There was a couple other pieces that need to be put into place before that. So we did 2016 Drone Nationals. We did that in New York City. That and was we, just recently, uh, earlier this year. Just recently, like a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason why we did that is it literally was 10-minute ferry ride from Wall Street. So we wanted to show <laughs> Wall Street and investors why they were all investing in this. Because we have a lot of people that are interested in investing in, but they never experienced first-person view flying. And so we put that all together. And there was a lot of interest in it. But the bigger one that came out of that was the second piece that's required from, uh, for, for drone racing. It's the fans and the brands are basically the, 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 the underpinnings of that because NASCAR, didn't, NASCAR wouldn't you know, exist if it didn't have your fans and your brands mm -hmm. on there. The piece that NASCAR didn't have in there that is required of us is the FAA because it, we are an aerial sport. Mm -hmm. We have right. airframes. We are traditional that. So our, our defining moment of this is a legitimate sport came when we got the phone call from the FAA on Tuesday that said... Of this week? Of oh. uh, last week. Okay. Uh, actually, maybe two weeks ago, just after mm -hmm. the, the Nationals. And they said, to us, they said to us, actually, this is really fantastic. Thank you for putting it in um, the most dense national airspace that, that <laughs> you could ever have. Um, we had probably 500 full-scale helicopter flights over around us over that, those three days, um, all from the Statue of Liberty. Um, and we put uh, 1,000 drones in the air over those three days with zero incidents. And so what that meant is, is that pilots now mm. are becoming so proficient in their close proximity and their flying and their skills that it, we proved to the FAA that drone sports is a legitimate sport. And they just invited us to have uh, accreditation at the same level of Red Bull Air Racing now. So what we're now seeing is, is the ushering in of a decade of sports that are going to be drone related. Um, that are going to be managed um, officially by the FAA. You know, that's a really important uh, observation and um, appreciation of the FAA, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, FAA, we often look at as, as the no people. No, no, and no. Can't mm -hmm. do it. But there's a whole other side of the FAA that's, uh, that's obligated to generate competitiveness in U.S. business. Mm -hmm. And recently, the FAA has opened the door on educational interpretation because mm -hmm. we all realize that we need a workforce that is really skilled in thinking in the complex method of thinking and mm -hmm. the critical thinking mm -hmm. and ethical design making, mm -hmm. design decisions, that is needed to make the drone business work. So the drone correct. business is moving faster than the workforce can support it. That's correct. So therefore there's an interpretation that says you don't even need uh, to deal with the certification and registration issues uh, if you're an educational institution. Uh, the, 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 the teacher or the professor may have issues there, but the mm -hmm. students can use drones in, in, their, in their work. Mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, bypass a lot of the more complex regulations that, that control that. So this, mm -hmm. this is designed to produce strong educational themes so we can build that workforce. Mm -hmm. Well, so, you, know, you have to look at it because, you know, we hired the FAA. We hired the FAA to specifically protect us and keep us safe. That's what their job mm -hmm. is, right? And so they did their job. They came in and we had this proliferation of drones and an explosion of drones, and they all went, whoa, sub, top, wait, 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 wait. We have to make sure that we keep this safe. And so as soon as there was, um, you know, the blanket no very first came out. But what I also saw was is that there was some very interesting um, proactive pieces towards, okay, show us. So we did. So we did drone racing. We did it on two times. We had both of them as observers on site. And they walked away going like, oh, okay, let's, let's make this into a scientific measure with rules mm -hmm. and regulations. Let's do certificate of waivers. Let's do all the pieces because... This is a legitimate sport. This is a commercial piece that can, um, uh, that American act, uh, America can actually um, engage in and, and make happen. Let me take that very observation and build it into our UAS test site functionality here in Hawaii after mm -hmm. we get back from our first That's break. That's very exciting. Okay, let's talk about that on our first break. Hey, how you doing? Uh, welcome to Abachi Talk. My name's Andrew Lanning. I'm your co-host. And we have a nice program here every Friday at 1 o'clock uh, on Think Tech Studios where we talk about technology and we have a little bit of fun with it. So join us if you can. Thanks. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. 
I also have a blog of the same name at cowielucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. Aloha. This is Reg Baker with Business in Hawaii. We're a show that broadcasts every Thursday at 2 o'clock. We would love to hear from you, and you can reach us in several different ways. We have a hotline that you can call in at 415-871-2474, or you can email us at thinktechhawaii.com, or you can tweet us at thinktechhi. Looking forward to hearing from you and seeing you on our next show. Aloha. Ted Rolson here in our studio downtown Honolulu, FinTech Studios, uh, our show Where the Drone Leads. Scott Wrestling, once again, Scott, thanks for coming on. Hey, and we've got Bruce Park standing by in <laughs> California as we attempt to quickly go through some really important and insight-rich uh, insight uh, uh, aspects of, of drone racing. What we were talking about just before the break was that the, what you were bringing up, Scott, is that the FAA has turned to you, the organization, that said, I am learning, I, the FAA, am learning from what you're doing. I see how it's done professionally. We can think of regulations and controls that would enable and allow that. Mm -hmm. And so rather than say no, we'll say, yeah, we'll help you figure this out. And, and this is exactly what the FAA wants in these FAA state test sites they've created. They want to push beyond the bounds of currently certified operation beyond line of sight, cluster operations. How about cluster operations and how about one guy running four drones against each other? Mm -hmm. I mean, all the things that the FAA wants to get information on, and they've constructed these FAA test sites for that reason, are served by addressing drone racing. Mm -hmm. So the idea, was, just as we were thinking here at break, was that somehow we need to take the state of Hawaii drone test site function and have in it an aspect that is associated with drone racing. And that could be the, the place that, that uh, people come from around the country to run their systems against uh, our, our, our uh, real and virtual mm -hmm. uh, obstacle, obstacle courses. Mm -hmm. And then that fits back to the, uh, the uh, UAS traffic management program that Bruce and I first talked about a, a year or so ago at NASA Ames. Bruce, uh, what's your current knowledge of the, how that UTM program is going and how could we associate drone racing with the kind of discoveries that UTM needs? Well, I, th I think that, you know, what's going on now with UTM, I mean, there's a big conference coming up, um, I think, in a couple of weeks in New York. Um, they're, still, they're still working on it to try to develop a system that will allow for the integration of drones into the national airspace. It's a, you know, all I can say is that it's a work in progress. Um, and, you know, of course, the FAA, I mean, they're designing it to help the FAA. Um, it's being run by NASA, generally speaking. Uh, so the intention is to see if they can't, how they figure out how they integrate these things. I don't think that drone racing uh, per se really infringes on that space to any appreciable degree. Um, I mean, we're racing, you know, less than 50 feet most of the time. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't think that that's going to be an issue of integration. Um, but the FAA is, is really watching closely as to what happens across the industry. And I, and I know that with respect to the drones, drone racing, uh, that they're currently looking at uh, community-based organizations to kind of step in and help define what safe racing is uh, and to try to facilitate that. And the uh, Drone Pilots Federation, which, which I put together, it, that's, the intention of that is to become one of those CBO uh, uh, operations so that we can help facilitate, uh, help facilitate what the FAA is doing with respect not only to drone racing, but to um, utilization in general. You know, and, and to take the point you just made about uh, drone racing not infringing upon the international airspace because of the way it's going to be controlled, I think there's probably a next step beyond that, which is to take the cognition and the way decisions are made and the way sensors are put together and the way a system like this reports to a system like this so that the pilot gets to see what's going on. There's probably an extract out of that that could be provided to the unmanned traffic management system in order to give them the benefit of that higher level of, of recognition or cognition that's taking place. Well, Ted, I want to interject here. I, I, I think that, you, that, that that's a correct observation, but what you're really seeing is the convergence of technologies uh, across a wide spectrum. The most extreme example of that that, I can, that I've recently heard is that a doctor took a drone pilot and put him in charge, didn't put him in charge, allowed him to utilize the uh, Da Vinci 
remote surgical apparatus, he took the test, he got a 95% because that pilot was accustomed to working with forward position view cameras. I mean, that's, that's really, you talk about a convergence going from flying a drone to being able to operate a very sophisticated surgical system. That's a big leap, but people are making it. That is incredible, and that goes to the cognition issue and the hand-eye coordination and other things that you in the world of virtual reality mm -hmm. manage. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a great uh, uh, transition, Bruce, from the subject of the specific technology and components here to the larger how they integrate into the expressive layer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So well, drone technology basically has a really simple um, format to it. So it has a, has a camera right in the front, and so using a set of goggles here, you actually control the, the, this drone uh, remotely by looking through the camera. And so the camera basically just projects in your, in your goggles. And so now you're sitting in the cockpit flying uh, 80 to 100 miles an hour, however fast you are. Uh, and so what's, what's really interesting about this technology is that it appeals to everybody's uh, you know, dream of flight. And it makes everybody a superhero. And it, and it gives you superpowers. So you can leap tall trees in a single bound. And, um, and it's, it is pushing us or to become the, a Da Vinci surgeon or uh, coming becoming out of a Da Vinci surgeon for real life. Right. That's right. So, cool. the, I mean, that's the basic uh, of things where things are going. We're headed very closely into a convergence of other things that are happening, which is the esports is happening uh, right now. That's a lot of gaming. The uh, augmented reality, like that, that's with Magic Leap. And they have a half billion dollars to do uh, data overlays within a 3D, um, within a real space. And so we're having this convergence that's kind of happening uh, on us. And drone racing is actually uh, a great sport to do all of those because what it does is that it needs all of those types of information overlays to go just from drone sports, but also up into UAVs, larger UAVs, inspection, uh, pipeline stuff, you know, anything that is in, from the industrial side of things. There's a, there's a really kind of an interesting leap and in integration between those two. And I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I was talking to somebody about um, doing pipeline inspection or very close proximity inspection of things. And our pilots are so good at flying yep. this in very, very fast measure that they can hit things and within three inches, they can fly through a, you know, a window at, in three inches to spare going 60 miles an hour. So if we could copy that thinking process they go through and generate sensors that, that, that feed that, that algorithm and that uh, targeting guidance navigation control system internally here and turn that into automation mm -hmm. so that the mission can run itself and you don't have to have that guy on the stick that would be the transfer that would be awesome mm -hmm. if we can push that forward and, and I'll, you know we're talking gonna, about but it's going to have a couple of things here because I'm you know I'm look I'm a true believer of artificial life and artificial <laughs> intelligence for quite some time but the issue that I see is that technology is super good at at factual pieces of, of collection, like the Google Google itself in the, in the web is a fantastic example. You can ask anything to Google. But if you ask Google or Siri, any of them say, hey, take me down to the store and get a blue one, there's no contextual relevance that they understand it. So it fails the Turing test on there because us as humans, we're fantastic at contextual understanding and just in and time. And biasing, modification, adjustment, right. uh, compensation, all Whereas that. Whereas we are not good at factual. We can't even remember that, you know, Somebody 10 minutes ago did What's something. What's his name, the guy on TV? Yeah, yeah. who's that guy? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Bruce. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is a really interesting convergence of where we are. And I think that, you know, with, with what I see with Bruce is doing, of, you know, Bruce is part of the AUVSI, which is, you know, up in the, the really large scale stuff. It's way above my pay grade. But the, the drone sports and drone racing is, is now becoming a big, um, formidable force in the room because it's the fastest of the innovation. It's the it's the guys making all the parts from 3D printers that are in their garage that are making this thing move extra fast. And so that's the really thrilling part of innovation that I see that's happening. And, and that, I think that's where we can find these vectors that, that extrapolate out in other areas. Mm -hmm. I, I know that the uh, thing that got me, my attention, I first met you guys about a year ago, and I stayed away from drone racing until um, I think Mike Elliott opened a box and showed me this exact item. I said, my God, this thing is totally purpose designed. This is the first piece of drone I've ever seen it is really well thought through. It's designed mm -hmm. for its mission. It's got foldable legs. The legs fold up so that if you hit something, it just folds up and mm -hmm. you put it in a box easy that way. Mm -hmm. This is all uh, uh, carbon composite. It's all uh, uh, laser cut and such. There's, mm -hmm. there's nothing left on the table here in mm -hmm. terms of un 
exploited technology mm -hmm. and shock well, this mounts. This is version one, and we're already on version <laughs> two now. <laughs> that, that, there you go. This is like six months old. And it it's is. Obsolete it's already. obsolete. Yeah, I'm like <laughs> 71 years old and way obsolete. But uh, uh, the, the other piece is, is that the police department, the fire department, the uh, law enforcement people, the lifeguards here could really benefit from this technology mm -hmm. if we can just make that transition and get it to them in a way that they don't have to become specialists. Mm -hmm. if, uh, and I, I'd like to think of some exercises we can run here that would generate that exposure. Without mm. the exposure, you, you don't have the context in which to well, even make you know, the you, connection. You and I had this conversation um, uh, a while ago, and it literally was, you know, you, current technology that's used for SAR, or search and rescue and emergency services, by the time you get it fired up and you do the checklist and do all that stuff, the guy's already drowned. So it, what it can't we go that way, right? We have to. It's a <laughs> paradigm shift, right? Uh -huh. It's a complete change. Yep. So um, if we push that under the auspice of racing, then we're going to get that That's it, faster. right. That's exactly Iteration. right. And we need Bruce's help on that because we need yep. to make sure it's tied in with UTM <laughs> and other, other uh, aspects of development. And, uh, you know, this is exciting stuff, and it's so exciting we've just about run our time out. We, we have this half-an-hour format now, which uh, is a uh, tougher, talkative guy like me to get, get past. Anyway, uh, Bruce, uh, we will have to shut down here in a minute. Uh, final thoughts on your side, sir. And by the way, Make them sound really impressive so Scott thinks you're working hard. <laughs> well, so my, my final, final thought is that, you know, in the past, Hawaii has been geographically isolated. That's not true any longer. So the things that you're talking about, Ted, can become a reality that, that, that your test centers can work, that the technology uh, can be brought to Hawaii by wire. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it, the potential there is, is really great. So I, I'm glad to see you're doing what you're doing. Let's take what take Bruce already has earphones on. Let's give Bruce the goggles. He could fly on Lanai from his he could Chase Lounge there in he Sacramento, could. right? That would <laughs> be the right. next step. I like that. <laughs> and Dr. Scott Resslin, yep. thanks so much for coming on. Thank and, you, and Ted. Thanks so much for taking the lead and making all this useful at the at yeah. the, you know my level and such. Well, this don't forget incredible. that we're doing the na the World oh, Racing Championship. Right. Thirty-eight countries, two hundred pilots on okay, Kulo Ranch. Thirty-eight countries. 200 pilots, Kualoa yeah. Ranch in October. O October 17th and 22nd. Go to DroneWorlds.com. Can we put up a website? Uh, DroneWorlds.com. DroneWorld.com, okay. And Drone Jerry Worlds. is really skilled at the DroneWorlds, plural.com, yep. okay. And the public is, is going to have an opportunity to interact with the folks involved. That's there. correct, yep. So we're going to see basically 200 people of, you might call them Silicon Valley credentials. No, no, these people. are all around the world. But I mean, these Everybody. are the, the equivalent of the global Silicon Valley. Correct. This yep. is a level of motivation, energy, and intelligence coming yep. in. This and is the best of the best. This. Everybody had to qualify in their country. Uh, so you were you were going to see the most spectacular drone racing you've ever seen in your life. That's pretty cool. Including okay. Team USA. All right. Well, Scott Russell, thanks for coming on the show thank again. You. And Bruce, thanks for standing by in Sacramento. Absolutely, and, Ted. Well, thank you very much. And don't look quite so relaxed because the boss is watching. <laughs>